So that's, that's kind of how I think about technology is not how do I reduce my headcount necessarily, but how can I use it more effectively on things that I value? Hello and welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the one platform that brings together financial reporting, ESG audit and risk teams, and maybe even Michigan and Ohio State fans, or could at least help Michigan fans with their sign stealing. My name is Steve Soder, accounting enthusiast and Diet Coke aficionado. I'm looking forward to debiting a great conversation, and I'm so happy to have you with us. I'm also happy to have Catherine Sy, erstwhile Michigan fan, and Josh Gertz joining us. Catherine, can you please tell the folks about yourself? I'm not an accountant or a Diet Coke aficionado, but I like drinking venti soy chais and asking questions of smart people like you and Josh and our guest today. So Josh, why don't you remind people who you are? Yeah, I've been on a, I've had the pleasure of being on a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so Josh Kirch, I'm a CPA. Um, I work in our capital markets division here at Workiva and happy to join you all today. Yeah, and we bulked up the crew because we're talking to a CFO today, Steve Cates, CFO of Westwater Resources. Yeah, I uh, I love that name. And there's a lot we want to ask Steve from his career journey to how he approaches the use of technology to what it's like being the CFO of a New York Stock Exchange listed pre-revenue company. So let's dive into it. Welcome, Josh and Steve Cates. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, let's start from the beginning. Steve, did you always want to be a CFO? You know, when I started my career, um, I started with the big four accounting firm here in Denver. Um, spent most of my time on the audit side and the energy practice. And back then it was trying to figure out, do I want to be partner or CFO? Um, I knew I wanted to continue to advance my career. Um, during the financial crisis, um, I ended up leaving KPMG, ended up in industry, and I've really just always gravitated towards the business side, probably more than the traditional accounting side, um, the debits and credits. And so, yeah, CFO ended up being the goal the, that I wanted to, to reach. Accounting. I'm an accounting major, have my CPA, um, and was just heading up the traditional accounting route um, and enjoyed it. But, you know, through the big four experience that I had, really learning about the businesses and the different types of companies. Um, I really enjoyed the conversations of how they thought about their business, how they were trying to maximize shareholder return. Uh, that just intrigued me a lot, the strategy side, more than just the traditional audit side. And, and using accounting and finance to try to help guide the operation and the business managers of making the right business decision. Well, it seems like we find often that that's a great recipe for a CFO. But I'm interested, what's it like to be the CFO at a pre-revenue company? Certainly the traditional metrics that we think of might not always apply, or maybe that they do. Uh, what can you tell us about what that's like? You know, it, it's it's interesting. Um, I've worked for a lot of publicly traded companies. I've worked for um, some rather large Fortune 500 companies. Um, I've worked for an S&P 500 company that was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And I've worked for some smaller mid-size cap type companies, but none of them have ever been pre-revenue. So this was different. Um, Westwater Resources was in the uranium mining business years ago. They've exited that space and now we're in graphite and we're building a processing plant to convert graphite flake into the material needed for the anode side of the battery for the lithium ion battery and supported the EV transition. And so they were already publicly traded and now we're heading down this new market so that's why we're pre-revenue. Um, I would say that the questions from investors are not so much on your operating metrics. They're not so much on GNA and overhead. It's much more your development plan, where you, where you are in progressing the project to unlock future value. Um, and really right now, a lot of it has to do with fundraising, um, raising additional capital. The higher interest rates, um, capital markets have been... Um, have been a little bit tighter. I've been seeing that they've been opening up a little bit more this year, especially in the kind of the project finance and the debt markets. Uh, they're opening up, people are wanting to put money to work, but you're now not just competing on your project compared to other projects, but in a historically low interest rate environment, what we had, the need for a return in yield wasn't as high of a return that they need now, because now you got to beat 
5% T-bills or whatever they're at now, right? So that that hurdle rate has gone up, um, which presents some challenges. Josh, I know you spend a ton of time with uh, companies who are looking at going public or raising capital. How would you weigh in on this discussion? It seems like in our conversations, it seems pretty consistent with, with what you're seeing out in the market. Yeah, I think raising capital is tough right now. I think Steve highlighted a couple things like the interest rate and capital markets have been slow. There hasn't been a great window. Values haven't been holding. And I think I think the challenge is everyone tries to continue to grow. To Steve's point is the return has got to be there and that's a higher hurdle now. Cost of capital is hard. Like with the higher interest rates, you're, you have, you're basically to finance you know this growth if you're borrowing debt, it's costing you somewhere between like 13 and 15% to do this stuff now. And if you're trying to raise that money through capital markets, it's more like 20, 25%. So you've got this balance of, hey, where do I get this money to infuse this growth? But then how much does it cost to get that money? And with those costs, just to be clear, for those who might not be familiar, you're not just talking obviously about the interest expense, that's an example, the transaction cost, right? Like what it actually takes to get that issued. Yeah, I think if you look at it, like, say you needed like $50 million, you know, like, okay, do I go borrow $50 million from a bank? Do I go sell my shares to the public? You know, that's not free either way. I mean, there's, you'd have to look at those different avenues and there's a cost associated, like a cut associated with each of those. And the the long and short of it is that those have got up incrementally over the past couple of years. How is a financial reporting team better than a dad joke? A dad joke can tell you what to call a busy accounting leader, but it's not going to tell you why. Really good financial reporting teams can pull together reports that tell you what happened last month and even tell you why. They just don't always have time to get to the why. That's where Workiva comes in. Top accounting and finance teams are using the Workiva platform to automate financial reporting, from financial statements to board reports, from 10Qs to S1s. Spend less time copying and pasting numbers and more time telling the story behind the numbers with data your auditors can trust. See why accounting and finance teams love Workiva at workiva.com slash accounting. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash accounting. Steve, I also just wanted to ask you, since you've been in the industry for a while, how you've noticed things changing since your time as a CFO and also just being in the industry. Yeah, so I've been I've been at this game for over twenty years. I'm starting to lose count. I think what I have seen over the past number of years, especially related to the CFO role and the CFOs that I have, I have worked under, um, is that they're with all the regulation that's coming out from the SEC and, and the FASB and the change in accounting, you're starting to see a little bit of a shift depend upon the company and how big that they do want a CFO, it seems like, that has some of that traditional accounting background. Um, some of the large companies, right, you've you've seen CFOs and then they have a chief accounting officer because maybe the CFO is a little bit more capital markets fo- focused, was part of an investment bank at some time, but they need somebody that can stay on top of the changing SEC regulatory environment to make sure that they don't run into any pitfalls there or... or, or um, you know, violate any regulations, but the smaller companies can't always, you know, they don't have the GNA to afford both. So I've seen a, I've seen a switch a little bit back towards a, a traditional CPAs having a shot to be a CFO uh, of a company. And I think that's changed. Um, but I think beyond that, whether the background is more on the finance side or traditional accounting side, I think you have to have a little bit of both to be able to do it well and a little bit of understanding. And I think you really have to continually think about what your plan B and C in a risk mitigation approach as a CFO. Um, with my team, we're always talking about, well, what if this happens? Well, Steve, that's pretty remote, but what if it does? What levers can we pull? What are we going to do? I think one of the things that's critical for a CFO is to bring that downside risk into the business conversations. Because when you're talking to business development, teams and, and and visionaries you know it's always blue sky and it, it's i think it's important for us to kind of bring in a little bit of what the downside risk could be and have a mitigation plan it's so interesting to me how this ebbs and flows because honestly if you ask this question like five years ago i would say it was trending towards having like a finance background more you know i think the risks were lower 
and they're like, hey, I want a CFO that's a strategy guy that can, you know, really weigh in and tell me like what the PL is telling me while we're moving. And it's so interesting as we've kind of gotten back into where regulation has come in more, where getting access to capital is harder. All of a sudden, it kind of starts to trend back a little bit. Like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, actually, we do need, you know, you get into like you've had companies file for bankruptcies and you do like oh, they've missed a lot of these things, I think, because they haven't had they haven't been taking into account those risks. It's interesting to kind of see it start to come back the other way. Yeah, I think I think it has to be a balanced approach. I mean, I think even if um, someone comes up kind of under the traditional CPA route, with SEC reporting background and those types of things that are really strong on the technical accounting side, I think you have to understand the business and the drivers of the business for a couple of reasons. One, I think that's how you get the right accounting answer, right? You, you can't get the right accounting answer if you don't understand the economics of a transaction or your business. But I also think that's how you can take the numbers and what's going on in the financials and communicate them effectively, uh, not only to management, but to shareholders as well, right? You're able to bridge that gap. Um, and so I, I think it's important to still have that business mindset and where am I going to try to add value to the organization every day? Well, we didn't even talk about like the intangibles of maybe what makes a good CFO. Are there any soft skills that you would say help help you get get into that position? When you get into the C-suite in general, they talk about um, the ability to communicate effectively, you know, not only speaking, but writing. I think writing is, is really critical, um, as well as just being able to present, you know, board presence and, and those types of soft intangibles. I think those are important. Um, but I think the biggest thing from an accounting and finance perspective is, is integrity, right? Like that's, that's the crux. If the numbers aren't right, if you can't trust the numbers, what else can you trust in the company of what they're saying? So you definitely want to get the blocking and tackling right um, and set the teams up well. And that's where I like to focus on some of the, the IT stuff. And I know you're wondering about how I view IT. And so one of the things is focusing on the block, blocking and tackling of accounting and finance. How do you approach using technology with your team? I think my main focus has always been trying to look for where my team is spending time. Where are we spending a lot of time in what I like to call swivel chair activities, where it's taking data from one screen or from a piece of paper on your desk and then putting it into a system, right? Like that, that to me does, is not adding value. I'd rather try to automate that process so that we can get to what is the data showing us in that analysis faster? Because that's what's going to be able to put information in the hands of the, the decision makers of the business quicker, especially the, the, the younger generation. They want to add value. And I think there's a lot of untapped skill set there that if they're spending all their time in data entry, for example, they're missing their development and we're missing being able to utilize that, that skills that they have on some analytics and some thinking. So that's, that's kind of how I think about technology is not how do I reduce my headcount necessarily, but how can I use it more effectively on things that add value, especially as a public company, right? You have to grow. You, you can't just say stagnant as a public company. It might work in certain private company scenarios, but not in a public company. Usually with growth, there can come a GNA uplift. Well, if you can automate and avoid that uplift, then all of that growth or more of it goes to the bottom line and creates value for shareholders. Um, so that's that's where I look for technology. Do you have a threshold, Steve, when your team comes to you and says, hey, you know what, there's this new technology out there, there's this thing that we could use that would make a huge difference. Is there a threshold where you say, okay, you know what, if it meets you know X, Y, and Z criteria, and, and I'm thinking specifically about risk, um, I feel like efficiency is fairly straightforward. If we can get something done a little more quickly, take some time out of close, faster decision-making, that kind of thing. But risk seems to be so intangible, yet at the same time, I bet you're thinking about risk all the time, as especially on a quarterly basis, right? You're signing on a Q or a K and thinking, okay, have all the processes been done correctly? You know, how much risk am I taking on personally when I sign this? I just wonder, like, is there a way for you to quantify that? Or is there a threshold where you would think, okay, yeah, I can really see a benefit to investing in this technology or this thing, whatever it is, because I think that's going to make a meaningful impact. Risk seems so hard to me in that equation, but but maybe it's not so hard. I'm not signing Qs or Ks right now. <laughs> right. I think, so risk always plays into my view on even process changes that might be manual 
whether I'm using technology or we're switching something around, risk always has to be there because again, you have to be able to trust the numbers, right? That, that blocking and tackling needs to be right. That's where you get credibility. Um, you know, for those that are trying to work up in their career right now, getting the blocking and tackling right gives you credibility internally with the management team that things are right and you know what you're doing. But then for Wall Street, that gives you credibility as well, right? Their numbers are right, everything's solid. Yeah, so risk always plays plays a role. Um, and, and what I try to evaluate is, are the efficiency gains and any additional risk coming in, is it worth it? And where I do see additional risk creeping in, lots of times you have to mitigate that, right? Like I talked about earlier, you got to figure out a way to make sure that you're comfortable with that. That might wipe out your efficiency gains, right? So it's always a balancing act. So I don't think I have a threshold, but using technology and AI in a 10K and 10Q process that takes numbers from your system and automatically populates them in for you and links more directly, I'd be okay with that level of risk because I know I have a team that can double check that stuff. So that's that's kind of how I think about that. Well, Josh, you interact with a lot of companies who are having this same dialogue. How do you see technology change in the landscape over the uh, short to medium term, let's call it? I think technology has to solve like the workforce problems that's out there. I, I mean, I take a similar take that Steve's got on it. I do think people are your greatest assets. How do you get the most out of your people? Don't like if you've got if you're trying to get data from point A, let's say data is like raw data lives in point A and point Z is data that I can look at and make a decision on that tells me the story of what the data is. Like that's kind of how I see it. I mean, as much of that front process that you can get to that you could automate, I think is the key thing. Like somehow, how can you take that raw data and get it to a point where the people need to come in and play and decipher that and provide the insights? Everything up until that, I think I think you should focus on automating, you know, until you can get it to a place where those people can look at it and you can like use their value to get there, I think is where I see it. And you can apply that to any process, whether it's closed, whether it's fp a like budgets and forecasts, investor decks just i mean you can almost take it anywhere and be like okay let, we've got to solve this kind of data lineage problem make sure we've got like the data coming through and anything we can do to kind of clean that data up or curate it so if someone can look at it put the story together get that in front of decision makers and if we can cut hours or days out of that process i mean that to me is that to me is where you focus 100 percent of like the technology piece on and it would seem like, uh, again, Steve, you're the CFO here, but it would seem like if you can take your existing control processes, your your disclosure controls and procedures framework, and if that can be applied equally to this technology, then that's probably a good indicator that, okay, you know what, this is ready for prime time. But if it can't, that would certainly be your red flag and say, okay, you know what, this is not ready for that. Therefore, this is not going to be a, a, a good use case for us to deploy quite yet, regardless of the efficiency improvements uh, that that might bring to your uh, to your processes is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I think the way I would think about the control environment in in IT technology is to the extent that you're right, the controls are embedded and they're working, and you can rely on them. That's that's fantastic. If there's a a gap in that where you need maybe some manual review or some other control to double check that that comes in, if that control is taking an hour a month, but it takes out two days of the close, I'll add a control in to offset that risk. So I don't think it has to be a hundred percent, but there is a, there is a cost benefit. And, you know, I like what Josh said. I, I think the cost benefit is on the value your team brings and utilizing your, your greatest asset. Well, that's really where the cost benefit is, is, is coming from. I wanted to come back to something you mentioned in the beginning about studying accounting so when you were a kid, you're telling me you knew you wanted to study accounting? No, no, I don't, I don't know many people who did. I think I, uh, gosh, as a young kid, I wanted to be a professional football or baseball player. Maybe, a, you know, I, I saw Top Gun when I was young. I wanted to, you know, who didn't want to be Tom Cruise um, and fly jets. So, um, yeah, no, the accounting was not on my radar at all. I, uh, I love baseball. I'm a, I'm a baseball junkie and when, went to college to play. Um, and when I got there, I had no idea what I want to do with my career. So I was like, you know what, I'll just do kind of business management, general business degree and, and figure it out. Um, 
first accounting course. I took that accounting test came out and, uh, took the first test, did really, really well on it. Um, and the professor was like, Hey, you could become a CPA and this is what you could do. And you can make a good living doing this. And I go for that. That was easy. Like, okay, I'll switch. So I really switched my major. Actually the, the nail in the coffin was I could go into the FBI or CIA. And I was like, well, that sounds actually pretty cool. Like, I don't know if I could do that with the normal business management degree. So I'll do that. Um, and then just through it, I, I found out that I really actually enjoyed business, enjoyed finance and economics. And, and, um, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff happening in the marketplace with, you know, Enron and WorldCom and all the audit firms and things going on that I was like, wow, this is kind of really interesting. Um, and so I decided to go the CPA route and I haven't regretted it, but no, I was being an accountant. <laughs> CPA was, was, I didn't even know what that was probably until I got to college and they told me after I took that test. <laughs> well, I'm not sure our listeners are keeping track, but boy, Catherine, how many times have we literally heard almost that exact same thing when you have asked that question? Why did you go into accounting? I did well on the test and the professor said I'd be good at it. So then I yeah. ended well, up the other thing, my major. Yeah, the other thing I knew is I'm, I'm not that uh, creative. And so I knew I probably wasn't going to have a crazy idea to, uh, you know, create Amazon or anything like that, you know, make billions. But I knew somebody would. And they needed some way to take care of the money for them. So it, it made sense I could just follow the money. That's right. Well, before we let you go, we end every episode with a fun closing question of the day. And since you said you were thinking of maybe being a professional baseball player, what would have been your walk-up song? Oh, my gosh, my walk-up song. So this is interesting. Um, my son plays baseball. He's a senior in high school. And that, that's a big discussion topic all the time in our house is what, what would be a good walk-up song. So, you know, gosh, it would have to be either something. I love country music, so it either have to be a country song or, uh, I don't know, maybe like Thunderstruck by uh, ACDC, something like that. Yeah, I'm not as creative as that. Like, I go back to like that movie Charlie Sheen was in. Was it, is it called Major League Baseball where he's like a pitcher and he has like the, yeah, you know, like the crazy hairdo and it comes out to like, um, What's the song? It's like a wild thing. You know, it's like something like that. I'm not sure I can like disassociate it with it. Like that might be like the peak song for uh, for an intro, but uh, that's probably where my head's at. Well, my, my response to that question is would have been my walk-up song. I, I, I'm still holding out, Catherine. I still think I've got a career in front of me uh, in, uh, in the MLB. So you'll have to wait and see when I step on that plate what they're playing. Actually, I... Thunderstruck was actually the very first thing that had occurred to me. So not only do we share uh, first names, Steve, apparently taste in music. As well. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. I'm Steve Soder. That was Catherine Sai, And this has been Off the Books, presented by the Workiva platform, which might help Ohio State with their Michigan game planning next season. Please subscribe, leave us a review, and tell your buddies if you like the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, please leave us a note in the comments or feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiba.com. Surf's up and we'll see you on the next wave.